Chapter 23, The Digestive System, Part 1. So, the digestive system consists primarily of the gastrointestinal tract. This is a tube that runs from our mouth to our anus. It consists of the mouth, where the oral cavity is found, the pharynx in the back of the throat, the esophagus, tube leading down to the abdominal cavity where we have the stomach, and then the small intestine and the large intestine, which of course ends with the anus. It is worth noting that the pharynx, this part of the gas digestive system, is shared with the uh, respiratory system. The pharynx is a shared structure for the respiratory system and the digestive system. Now we also have accessory organs that are important for the digestive system. These include things like the salivary glands found up in the head, the tongue and teeth, also found in the oral cavity. And then down in the abdomen, we have the liver, very, very important organ, the gallbladder, and the pancreas hiding behind the stomach. Functions of the digestive system include ingestion. This is taking food into the mouth. So you ingest something, you put it in your mouth. Secretion. There are lots of things secreted for the uh, digestive system. Uh, acids, buffers, enzymes, water, things like saliva, gastric juices in the stomach, pancreatic juices, lots and lots of enzymes, lots of things. Mixing and propulsion. The food and within the gastrointestinal tract is going to be churned and mixed and moved along the tube-like structure. Digestion. Digestion is a uh, breakdown of food. This is through mechanical digestion, which is taking the physical food and breaking into smaller and smaller pieces, which is when we chew. And then chemical digestion. Chemical digestion is when we take big molecules in the food, like carbohydrates, and we break them down into smaller chemicals, like the simple sugars. And that's usually done by enzymes. Absorption. Absorption is the movement of the digested nutrients through the uh, gastrointestinal tract, usually the small intestine, and into the bloodstream and the lymph and lymphatic system. And then finally, defecation. Elimination of the feces, of the materials that were not digested, were not absorbed, and also many bacteria that live in our large intestine. All right, the peritoneum. Peritoneum is a large serous membrane. It connects to and wraps around lots and lots of structures in our abdominal cavity. By wrapping around these structures, it helps to um, reduce the friction from the intestines and the stomach moving around slightly within the abdominal cavity. And it also helps to attach these structures to each other and to the abdominal wall. So, as I said, lubrication, reducing the friction. As I'm sure you remember, a serous membrane has two layers, one lying on the organ, the other away from the organ, and in between those layers is a space filled with fluid, serous fluid. So, lubrication, reducing friction, very important. Again, it also attaches organs to the abdominal walls, helps to hold the organs in place. It also is a structure in which blood vessels, nerves, etc., can run along to get to various structures of the gastrointestinal tract. And it turns out it can provide some abdominal organs some protection. Turns out there's a layer of the peritoneum that lies, so I'll go back one, that lies right here in front of the anterior abdominal wall. And that layer has got a lot of fatty material, so it can provide some cushioning to protect the abdominal organs. All right, the mouth, the beginning of the digestive system. Mouth includes, of course, the upper lip and lower lip, the various teeth, the tongue. We have the hard palate, bony hard palate, part of the roof of the oral cavity. Then the soft palate made up of uh, muscle and connective tissue. And then there's that little bitty dangly bit, in the back of the throat. That is called the uvula, the soft palate and the uvula are important because when we swallow, they help to block the passage to the nasal cavity. So they prevent food and drink from going up into the nasal cavity. 
And there are these salivary glands. We have three pairs of salivary glands. We have the parotid glands found uh, just in front of the ears. We have the submandibular glands underneath the mandible and the sublingual glands underneath the tongue. All of these, all six of these salivary glands produce saliva. And saliva is primarily water. It is, wow, like 99.5% water. It has uh, some electrolytes and it also has some enzymes. There's the enzyme lysozyme. Lysozyme is important. It has an antimicrobial function. Try to kill any pathogens we might be consuming with our food. And also it has salivary amylase. Salivary amylase is an enzyme that digests and breaks down carbohydrates. So the beginning of chemical digestion occurs in the mouth by the enzyme salivary amylase, which is breaking down carbohydrates. Uh, so of course, the tongue. The tongue is very important for manipulating food, moving food around. There are lots of extrinsic muscles connecting to the tongue to help move it. There are lots of muscles within the tongue, intrinsic muscles to help it move. And then of course, we have all those bumps, all those papillae on the surface of the tongue. Some of them provide friction to help the tongue manipulate and move food around. And some of them, as we know, are taste buds to help us enjoy the flavor to taste the food we eat. Teeth. We have teeth. Uh, they are also known as dentes, hence dentists being called dentists. And they are not bones. Teeth are not bones. The teeth can be broken down into three regions. You can have the crown. The crown is the part of the tooth that is above the gum line. You have the neck. The neck is the part of the tooth that is at the gum line, at the gingivae, at that tissue. And then, of course, the root. The root is the part of the tooth that is in, within the bone. So crown, neck, root. You can also look at the tooth by layers. The uh, most superficial layer is the enamel. The enamel is, of course, the hardest substance produced by our body. Uh, the deep from that is the dentin. The dentin makes up the bulk of the tooth by volume. And then deep to that is the pulp. The pulp is the most living part of the tooth, where we have nerves and blood vessels and so on. So when you have a toothache, it is the pulp in the pulp cavity that is experiencing the discomfort. We have two sets of teeth or dentitions. We have the deciduous set, also known as the baby teeth, uh, that first come in and then over uh, the early years of life will fall out and be replaced by the permanent teeth. So this skull here is showing some of the baby teeth. And you can see the adult teeth within the skull coming in, forming and starting to push out the baby teeth. Uh, if you look at a qu one quarter of the uh, mouth, you can see that we would have three molars, two premolars, one cuspid, and two incisors. That means that in the entire mouth, if we count up all the teeth, you would have eight incisors, four cuspids, eight premolars, and 12 molars. However, if you had your wisdom teeth removed, that would be the last of the molars. In that case, you would have only eight molars. The oral cavity is where we start the mechanical digestion called mastication. This is when we chew up the food and mix it with the saliva. This moist mass is referred to as the bolus. As we already mentioned, chemical digestion also occurs via salivary amylase. It helps to break down carbohydrates. And then gustation, the sense of taste, and the movement of the bolus into the pharynx, moving it from the oral cavity to the pharynx. Uh, well, some disorders of the oral cavity include tooth decay, known as dental caries. So cavities would be tooth decay. This person has some pretty severe cavities. All right, moving on to the pharynx. We know the pharynx uh, is important for connecting the oral cavity to the esophagus. It also is important for attach, connecting the nasal cavity to the larynx. So it is uh, part of the digestive system and the respiratory system. In the digestive system, we only use the oral pharynx 
and the laryngopharynx. And as the bolus gets pushed into the pharynx, uh, we begin what's called swallowing, swallowing, moving the bolus from the oral cavity to the esophagus. Uh, once you move the bolus far enough into the pharynx, swallowing becomes automatic, becomes a reflex that you cannot stop. All right, from here, we go to the esophagus. The esophagus connects the pharynx to the stomach. The esophagus, as we can see, passes through the neck, through the thoracic cavity, and ends at the very beginning of the abdominal cavity. And the pharynx is where we begin the part of the gastrointestinal tract that is the uh, meaty tube. So gastrointestinal tract from here on out, from the esophagus to the anus, is a meaty muscular tube. The tube the, of the gastrointestinal tract has four layers. The deepest layer is the mucosa. It uh, surrounds the space within the tube called the lumen. That is where the bolus of food will be traveling. Um, it is lined with epithelial tissue and, surprise, surprise, it produces mucus. Here, the production of mucus is to act as a lubricant to help move the food along to prevent it from sticking to the walls of the um, gastrointestinal tract. The uh, next superficial layer is the submucosa. The submucosa is connective tissue, blood vessels, nerves, and also some glands are embedded within it mostly glands producing mucus. The uh, next layer is the muscularis layer. The muscularis layer has two layers of smooth muscle tissue. It is the smooth muscle tissue in the muscularis layer that will be moving the materials along the gastrointestinal tract. And the outermost layer, the most superficial layer, is the serosa. And the serosa is actually also part of the peritoneum in many places. So the visceral layer of the peritoneum often is what is forming the serosa, the outermost superficial layer of the gastrointestinal tract. All right, the esophagus. Again, as I said, it attaches to the inferior border of the pharynx. It is posterior or behind the trachea, and it leads through the thoracic cavity to the abdominal cavity where it connects to the stomach. The meaty tube of the esophagus has the four layers we expect. The only difference is the superficial layer, previously known as the serosa, is in this case known as the adventitia. This is because there is no peritoneum in the thoracic cavity, so the adventitia is formed of its own uh, connective tissue. So mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, adventitia. There is an upper esophageal sphincter. This helps to control the passage of food into the esophagus. And also, more importantly, it prevents air entering the esophagus when we're not swallowing food and drink. The food, the bolus, is moved down the esophagus through a series of muscular contractions. These muscular contractions are referred to as peristalsis. They push the bolus down the esophagus to the stomach. Gravity is not involved, so you could stand on your head and still swallow food. The end of the esophagus, or the beginning of the stomach, is the lower esophageal sphincter. The lower esophageal sphincter prevents the contents of the stomach from backing up into the esophagus. When this sphincter doesn't function properly, you can experience the sensation of heartburn. So heartburn is when the contents of the stomach uh, enter the esophagus. The acid of the stomach goes up into the esophagus and causes discomfort. Heartburn is an isolated event that occurs rarely. However, if it occurs frequently, then what you may are suffering from is gastroesophageal reflux disease, where the lower esophageal sphincter is not closing properly. You're getting lots of acid up back into the esophagus, leading to chronic pain and increasing the likelihood of esophageal cancer. In some rare cases, it can also go all the way up the esophagus, and that acid can end up in the larynx, causing laryngitis. This is the end of part one of this lecture.